Kuecho. The President, please be seated. The court is now back in session. As scheduled, the chamber continues to hear the testimony of Mr. Hedder. Cautions continue to be put by the prosecution. Mrs. Sarkovati is now directed to report to the chamber regarding the current status of the parties to the proceedings today. Mrs. Saikovati, good morning, Mr. President and Your Honours. All parties to the proceedings are present, except Mr. Nunchi, who is present but in his holding cell due to the ruling by the trial chamber due to his health concerns. Today, the chamber continues to hear the testimony of Mr. Heather, and uh, Mr. Heather is right in the courtroom, and we do not have a reserved uh, witness for today. The President, thank you, Mrs. Saikovati. Without further ado, we would like to now hand over to the prosecution to continue putting questions to Mr. Hedder. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, Mr. President, Your Honours. May it please you. Good morning to my fellow counsel. And good morning again to you, Mr. Hedder. I'd like to start, please, by asking some clarification questions in relation to your testimony towards the end of yesterday. You will recall that you confirmed an extract from E31714 in relation to the refugee interviews in 1980 and reference to the interviewee Lonya, also known as Lorne, the passage of drying up the people from the enemy being part of a long-standing plan, and that being the relevant slogan. In relation to that, you said that you'd heard it from many people over many years and that you'd heard it before April 1975 on radio broadcasts. And it's the radio broadcasts I'd like to ask some further questions about. Can you help on what, in what context this phrase, dry up the people from the enemy, was being broadcast? What I mean by that is what was the subject matter what was the context in which this phrase was being used? Um, it, it referred to a situation in which there was contestation for control and loyalty of population. Um, and the notion was that either by military or political or other means, um, the, the proportion, the number of the number of the, the proportion of the population under enemy control, from the point of view of the Khmer Rouge, should be reduced. Um, and in practice, this meant their relocating. Uh, from enemy controlled zones, to use the Khmer Rouge terminology, to Khmer Rouge controlled zones, liberated zones, uh, or as they routinely put it, from areas temporarily controlled by the enemy to the liberated zones. And in general, in terms of the, at least the public propaganda, um, this was presented as being something that was voluntary. Um, in other words, people were encouraged to flee or invited to flee from the, those zones temporarily held by the enemy into the liberated zones. Um, in interview data, uh, again, both before and after April 75, and when I say after, I'm talking in fact, primarily from late 
1978, end of the 1980s, was clearly associated with this term of evacuation, a term that's conventionally translated as evacuation. Um, and at least in some of those interviews, to my recollection, it was made clear that this could be done forcibly, that is, or in, in a compulsory manner. So it could refer either to people being persuaded politically to leave enemy controlled zones and join the liberated zones, or it could be used to refer to a situation of military seizure of certain territory and therefore certain groups of people uh, who would then be removed to the liberated zones uh, under this rubric of evacuation. The President, uh, Mr. Heder, could you please be reminded that uh, you are summoned to appear before the Chamber to give testimony to the Chamber, and uh, with that, when you address your responses to the co-prosecutor, it would be more appropriate if you can just turn a little bit uh, to the front so that uh, you are now talking to the chamber, please. I want to ask questions now about the incidents that you had direct personal knowledge of in Udong and Kampong Cham. Can we take Kampong Cham first? Because you set that in a time frame of September 1973. In respect of the evacuation in Kampong Cham, was the information you received from interviewees consistent with that being a voluntary evacuation or a forced one? Um, trying to dredge it up, call it up from memory. Um, elements of both. Um, as I re and I, I, I would add, I was I wasn't there until some time after the event, so it wasn't as it was in the case of Udom, almost immediately after the event. Some time had elapsed. Um, and, I mean, I, my recollection is that s some people described being forcibly removed, or, or described others being forcibly removed, and there were some who eventually managed to return. Um, while others describe not going exactly voluntarily, but being willing to go uh, under the circumstances of the time. Uh, there were some who were um, displaced persons, internally displaced persons would be the current terminology, uh, who would come into the Kampong Jam town area for various reasons and who were willing um, to go back to where they had come from. But my recollection is that primarily it was by compulsion. The same question in respect of Udong when you were there on the 19th of March 1974 in terms of forced voluntary. My, uh, off the top of my head, my recollection of those specifics are, are less clear. I think I only went for a day or two. I didn't do extensive interviewing, so I had this sense that people were evacuated, as I said yesterday, to the west. But as for the details, either I didn't get any, or if I did get them without checking back, I don't remember. But in terms of Udong, you said uh, yesterday that Udong was deserted. Can you, again, just, just perhaps explain that or give a bit of color or paint the picture about this deserted? Uh, 
Well, when, when I arrived at Udon, I mean, the town was effectively deserted. As I said, there were maybe a couple of dozen people who had evaded or somehow evaded the evacuation, either hit, managed to hide themselves or had separate themselves from the evacuation columns who I spoke to, I, I think it was rather briefly, uh, but otherwise there was no one there. Uh, when I went up to the pagoda and where I saw the, the bodies of the, the nuns, uh, there were no monks left, there was nobody, nobody else, there were only the bodies, there were no, nobody alive uh, on the pagoda grounds, um, as far as I can recall. So both the town and, and, and the pagoda were empty, virtually empty. My final question yesterday was about the evacuation of Phnom Penh, and we dealt with, if you remember, Pond's notebook. Can I ask you, please, with your folders, I don't know where they are, oh, sorry, they've not been given back. Mr. President, can I please give Mr. Head of the folders which we've had in safe custody overnight? The President, as you may proceed, and court officer is directed to bring these documents to the witness, please. Mr. Hedder, can I ask you please to look at file four, tab one. You should have, I hope, reassessing as I call it in its short form. Can you confirm that? Yes. And I'd like you please to look at page six, and it's the section leading to footnote 17. This is to remind everyone E190.1.398, and can I ask please that all references today when I give a document are shown on the screen. Also to be abolished into the worker peasants as part of this uprooting socialist revolution were members of what the official CPK class analysis designated separate or special class types that did not fit neatly into its broader class scheme of feudalists, bourgeoisie, petty bourgeoisie, peasants and workers in addition to intellectuals, these other class types included Republican soldiers and police, Buddhist monks and all nationalities, brackets chuntiet, i.e. national minorities. Footnote 17 then references two DK cadre notebooks and references are given from the DC CAM collection of KNH0010 and KNH071. So again, can I ask please something about these DK Carter notebooks when you first saw them? And um, again, just a little bit more detail. Uh, this again goes back to a time uh, before the DC CAM cataloging system was uh, settled. 
uh, DC CAM had in its possession a fairly large number of notebooks, uh, mostly old society school copy books um, that from the content and the style appeared to me at least to be CPK cadre notebooks in which they had notations on meetings they had attended or uh, party study documents they had um, received such as revolutionary flags or revolutionary youth um, and DC Camp had given them a series of temporary cataloging numbers which are the numbers that I cite so I leafed through these notebooks looking for things that I thought might be interesting and the material that's in the substance of the text comes from the notebooks that are cited in this particular footnote. So the, 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 the documents are in Khmer, I did my own translation and worked them into my, the body of my text. Uh, Mr. Heder, I think there's a, a request that you sit slightly closer to the microphone if possible. Next, I'd like to move to a document that's not in your folders. This is document E3-387. And can I please hand you a copy of this document? This is an interview that you confirmed on the first day of evidence that you had had with this person. I don't want you to name him. I'm not going to name him. But for everyone's benefit, TCW-494. Mr. President, can I please hand over the record of this interview that Mr. Hedder had with this individual? Mr. President, you may proceed indeed, and court officer is now directed to bring the hard copies of these documents for the witness. Is your memory refreshed by looking at the first page? It's a transcript, again, of this interview. Can I start by taking you to your page four? This is English ERN 00350203, French 00441416 and Khmer 00379483 through 84. If we look at page four on yours, Mr. Hedder, about two thirds down the page, there's a sentence beginning in July 1975, I went to liberate. Do you have that? I'm now gonna read it in full. Uh, in July 1975, I went to liberate the whole territory and I was assigned a new task, serving as Deputy Secretary of Sector 21 and Head of the Sector 21 Committee in charge of economics, administration, education, and organization. Again, can you confirm that that's an accurate reco recording of what was said to you in this interview? Um, with the caveat that this is not my translation, but the court's translation, yes. Can I please take you to the next page for you, which is page five, English ERN 00350204, Khmer 00379484, through 85. Quote. Now let's go to the second period starting from 1973 to the 18th of April 1975. During this period, Pol Pot reformed his policy. In reforming the policy, I noticed as follows. The first thing was that they raised class issues and class struggle in the society. They mentioned five classes, such as workers, farmers, petty bourgeoisie, feudalists, and capitalists. 
Among the five classes, they valued only worker and farmer class, while other classes were totally ignored and oppressed. Even middle class farmers, upper class farmers, petty bourgeoisie, monks, intellectuals were entirely oppressed. We also noticed their dictatorship issues and their peasant class. Is that an accurate uh, recording uh, or reflection of what was said in this interview? Um, again, with the caveat that this is not my translation, I would say generally yes. I'm somewhat troubled by the use of the word oppressed. And before being confident uh, of confirming the, 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 the meaning, the sense, I'd actually like to see or hear the, the Khmer. It doesn't quite track for me could be correct, but it seems slightly peculiar. So uh, with that caveat, yes. Uh, Mr. Hebert, we're having a Khmer version printed off. <coughs> Perhaps if I can move on, and then we'll come back to, uh, to this point. Can we go to the bottom of page five? Same ERNs. The four one six lines up from the bottom. This extract. just setting the time really it's it, it's talking the extract and we in fact get the date two lines from the bottom from 1973 onwards they had conflict with Vietnam so the person is talking about 1973 can we go over your page which is on to page six English 00350205 Khmer 00379485 through 6 and French 00441418. Top of the page. So they were concerned about the remaining forces doing other activities. This time they mainly used security position and it was the security position which was relevant to class struggle and class dictatorship issues. This is what I would like to describe briefly. We noticed another point when monks and pagodas were gradually eliminated. Prisoners of war and defectors had previously been told that they were allowed to live in certain ways. This time, prisoners of war and defectors of Lon Nol were wiped out. Belief and religion for both Cambodians and other ethnics were prohibited. Buddhism and Khmer superstition were prohibited as well. Again, can you confirm that that uh, is an accurate reflection of what you were told in this interview? Um, yes, but again, with the same reservation, I'd like to see. I, see, I can see I can see the Khmer here, uh, but it would be easier if I had a hard copy to. to the, hard, the hard copy is coming now. Mr. Okay. President, can I please hand a hard copy of the Khmer version? The President, uh, you may proceed. Mr. Hedder, I'm going to go back to the first oppressed because that was the first word you mentioned. The Khmer page, and these are in the top left hand in dark, bold type, the ERN numbers. It's um, oppressed 
I think you'll find at the very top of Khmer page 00379485. The sentence was, um, even middle class farmers, upper class farmers, petty bourgeoisie, monks, intellectuals were entirely oppressed in the official court translation. English ERN 00350204, page 5. Um, the, the, the nuance here is that um, one might, one could possibly misread the English translation as meaning that these classes, the classes mentioned, uh, were to be oppressed by the Khmer Rouge. It's, it's in, in fact saying that they were among the classes who were oppressed by the exploiting classes of the old society. And the second part, the sentence I was interested in, this is on English page six. Khmer page zero zero three seven nine four eight five and it's towards the bottom of that page. And the phrase I was interested in in terms of translation or this time prisoners of war and defectors of Lon Nol were wiped out. Um, yes, um, this is a phrase which I conventionally translate as swept cleanly away. Thank you. That's a phrase many of us are familiar with. Um, can I take you back to the English now, but have the Khmer to hand. It's in the middle of page six. This is in, well, I've already given the ERN. So. Uh, we were ordered to fight at 1 a.m. on the 31st of December. It says 1974, but can you check the Khmer as to whether it's, uh, yes, 31st of December 1974. And the war had to be over on the 30th of June 1975. So they held a meeting to realize attacks on every battlefield. At that time, did they succeed? Generally speaking, gunfire was broken out on all battlefields on the 1st of January 1975 at 1 a.m. as planned. Again, can you confirm that that's uh, an accurate reflection of what you were told in this interview? Yes. Still on the same page, still the same ERNs. During the attacks, Pol Pot estimated that victory would be achieved in February 1975. And he disseminated the information down to all districts and sectors. He ordered all districts and sectors to build houses for people to be evacuated from Phnom Penh or provincial towns to countryside. 
During that time, they announced that Phnom Penh dwellers were to be evacuated. So in February 1975, they disseminated the information to all districts and sectors to, be house, uh, to build houses for those soon to be come deportees. And I'll carry on because the next bit is also relevant. Nearly two months later, the country was liberated. In, no, I'm going to pause there. Can you confirm that that's an, uh, an accurate description of what you were told? Yes. I'm moving on to another general subject now. I'd like you to put that statement to one side, but we are coming back to it later on. The topic is command and authority structure. File four. Tab three. <clears throat> you should have one page, is that correct? E number E one three one stroke one stroke thirteen point three. This is an extract from your book entitled Racism Marxism. Labeling and genocide in Ben Kiernan's The Pol Pot Regime. You should have page 32 in bold at the top. It's talking about the concept of party center, and you state that it was inherited by the CPK from the Chinese and Vietnamese communists. And the footnote 48 states in Chinese and Vietnamese communist parlance. Center refers to the highest leading structures of party organizations and of the country's political authority in the state sphere, including the party central committee and its various departments, the central government and other administrative bodies at the central echelon. You then refer in footnote 48, and I can't pronounce them, but you refer to a 1971 document in Beijing, a Hanoi University Press document from 1986, and a Hanoi document from 1978. Can you confirm that you read those documents and that they were your source? Uh, yes. Mr. Hedder, in, in the documents that you have looked at in Chinese, Vietnamese, and Cambodian, have you ever encountered the term party center as the party central committee? Sorry, I didn't see it. Um, the, the, I think the answer to that is that yes, it, but only in the sense that the party central committee is one of a number of bodies that could be described or could be referred to by this phrase, the center. The center refers to a level 
within the party hierarchy or structure and not necessarily to any specific body at that level, either all of them or some of them or one of them. So the phrase in and of itself, party center, uh, is somewhat ambiguous. Thank you. File four, tab four. So your existing file, tab four. Document number E348, seven candidates. Can you please go to page 46? Uh, when I say page 46, you don't have the whole of the document, but if you look at the pages that you do have, they are paged in the top of the document. Do you have the page 46? Thank you. It's reference to the statutes and you say this the statutes declared that the central committee's duties included implementation of the party's lines throughout the country giving instructions to all its subordinate zone sector and municipal organizations and to the party organs taking responsibility for various nationwide departments and administering and deploying cadre and party members within the party as a whole, while maintaining a clear and constant grasp on their biographies and political, ideological, and organizational stances, and constantly educating and indoctrinating them in terms of politics, ideology, and organization. We know the document very well. It has case uh, E3 number E3 stroke 214. Mr. Prosecutor, please hold on. Uh, Council Victor Coupe, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honours. Good morning, Council. Um, we're reaching now um, a topic of questioning uh, in which uh, we would require a ruling from the Chamber. Um, I have not an objection to the way of the phrasing of the question in particular. Um, prosecution is referring to a book which is on the case file. Prosecution is asking uh, the witness, uh, presumably, uh, about the source um, uh, in a footnote. However, this book is called Seven Candidates for Prosecution and obviously has been written with a certain purpose in mind. Um, maybe the witness at one point will elaborate on the why, on, on the reasons why he wrote this book. But obviously the title of the book itself, Seven Candidates for Prosecution, suggests that the book was written with the intent to uh, present uh, evidence in relation to not only uh, Hugh Sampan, but also our client. Um, uh, so we have now here a situation that we have a witness who has extensive role, uh, who played an extensive role in, in the investigation, now being asked questions about a book which is in essence uh, a, a, a plaidoyer for prosecuting and ultimately convicting uh, our client. So, although not objecting in a technical sense as to the way questions were phrased, I do object uh, that we now get into a situation that this witness is basically um, talking about his book, why these people, uh, including our client, should be prosecuted. So I would like to have a ruling um, on, of your chamber as to the, the lawfulness, so to speak, uh, or in respect of questions to this witness about this specific book. Mr. President, Your Honours, can I make it plain, as I hope I did yesterday, that I will not be asking Mr. Hedder any opinions based on this book. This book 
has been admitted in evidence. Objections were submitted and ruled upon. It is on the case file. It has an E3 number. It is therefore, on the face of it, relevant and reliable. There may be a need for a ruling if I was stressing opinion. I'm not. I'm continuing the practice that I have now undertaken for a day and an hour in accordance with the trial chamber's direction of reading statements from books and asking questions about sources. That will continue to be my practice throughout this examination and I ask please to proceed in the manner that I have already been conducting my examination. Can I add, I've not even asked the question yet. Mr. President, I hand over the floor to Judge uh, Silver Card Wright uh, to clarify the ruling of the Chamber concerning the objection by the defense team for Mr. Nguyen Chia in relation to the uh, questioning uh, by the prosecutor based on uh, the books and statements. Uh, Judge, you may proceed. Thank you, President. <clears throat> the Chamber has decided that the objection is not sustained. Uh, first, the book, <clears throat> excuse me, the book is on the case file and has been assigned an E3 number. Uh, and secondly, if the objection is to the probative value of the book, then that is a matter for the Chamber ultimately to determine. Thank you, President. How many versions are you aware of of these statutes? Um, I have a couple of originals, or what I believe are originals, in my possession, and a number of copies which I I've always presumed were of the same document in my possession as well. I know DC CAM has some originals and or copies on file. There are other originals and copies floating around in various places. Maybe Dave, David Chandler, I presume, has one or the other or both. Uh, there are other, others who have studied the matter who have one or the other or both. If the question is, are there alternate versions? Uh, if so, I, I, I haven't been aware of that. Uh, and based on your factual research, not opinion, not speculation, when were these statutes adopted? Uh, 
Um, I'm sure I've been told somewhere along the line in interviews that it was January 1976, and I'm pretty sure there's also reference to that fact in revolutionary flag or revolutionary use, revolutionary youth from around this period. Do you remember when we were, um, you were giving evidence in Cambodian communism about the 1960 Congress and adoption of statutes? Can you uh, confirm that statutes were featuring in 1960? Uh, yes, presuming we can believe what Pol Pot, Nguyen and others have said, they themselves have said as much. File 4, tab 1. Page 12. English ERN. 00661466 Khmer 00830775 French 00798242 it's in reference, if, if it helps everyone, to footnote 64. Uh, sorry, I should say reassessing in its short form E190.1.39.2. To a great extent, however, the, linkid, the linkage between the centre and the districts was mediated via zones and sectors. Leading zone and sector cadre came to Phnom Penh for regular meetings and special consultations with Pol and Nguyen. And there was also much written communication back and forth between the center and the zones. Footnote 65 then references Kaipok interview. And you go on to say, uh, this is in fact, sorry, in, in footnote 14, which will be back on page 5 so it's it's inserting here also footnote 14 to give context to the Kaipok interview and so you say in an interview with the author brackets header on the 22nd of February 2001 in Siem Reap Cambodia Pok agreed to discuss evidence against himself and others on the condition that his remarks not be made public while he was alive. And then in terms of what he said, he conceded that as secretary of the CPK North brackets, later central close brackets zone committee, he had implemented a CPK policy of killing Khmer Republic officials, initiated the arrest and ordered the execution of alleged traitors among CPK members subordinated to him and followed orders from Nguyen to assist in the arrest of other alleged traitors in the CPK ranks. 
who he knew would be executed after interrogation by the CPK Security Service Headquarters, S21 in Phnom Penh. Hock's admissions with regard to initiating arrests were corroborated in an interview by the author with the former third-ranked member of the North Zone Committee, Pich Tieng, alias Tao, on the 14th to 15th of May 2001 in An Lung Ven, Cambodia. My first question is, is what you've stated an accurate reflection of what Kai Pork told you in the interview you had with him? Y yes. Little bit more context, Kai Pork, Secretary of the CPK, North later Central Zone Committee. A little bit more information, but not a life history. Uh, yes, he was um, from around May 75, Secretary of the North Zone, later redesignated the Central Zone, uh, a member of the Central Committee um, through the end of the period of Khmer Rouge rule, fell somewhat out of favor with the top leadership after January 1979 and was eventually placed into a form of semi-retirement, broke away from the Khmer Rouge in the late 90s, I think it was 98, um, and was made a general officer in the government army. And th this particular interview was, in fact, arranged for me by uh, General Paul Saruan, who's currently uh, Commander-in-Chief, Supreme Commander of the Cambodian Armed Forces. Mr. President, subject to a direction or an application from the court, um, well, can I ask Mr. Head of the question, is the interview you had with Kai Pork recorded in any way? Um, handwritten notes only, no, no tape recording. Where are the handwritten notes, and could they be sent here today or over the weekend? Uh, I don't have them with me. They're somewhere in the UK, I suppose. If on the direction, if it was given by the President, that you would be given any available resources here to assist in obtaining that, would it be possible? Um, the answer to that question is there's 45 filing cabinets scattered around various places in and around London. I don't know which filing cabinet they're in. Um, it wouldn't be easy. It would take time. All right. Thank you. The second interview that you mentioned, in other words, to use your phrase, Hock's admissions with regard to initiating arrests, were corroborated in an interview with Pik Tieng alias Tao. Um, how was that interview organized and how was it recorded? Um. Uh, this, this person was, after January 1979, was Democratic Kampuchea ambassador to China. 
um, and I met him in Beijing in late 1978. So he and I were acquainted. Um, in 2001, I approached him directly, um, him, and his, him and his wife directly in, in Longvang, and he agreed to, to speak to me. Um, again, no tape recording, only handwritten notes in the same situation, I'm afraid, as with those of the interview of Gap Oak. And for completeness, one of the other sources that you gave in the footnotes was uh, the minutes of a quorum of the meeting on grassroots work, 8th of March 1976. We're well familiar with this document, E3-232. Still in the document reassessing, page 13, please, and it's in reference to footnotes 68 and 69. Uh, zone secretaries provided information to the center about the situation in their areas of responsibility, demonstrating that the zones were keeping track of all activities right down to the district level and assessing the zone's right and wrong experiences in implementation of party policies. And in support of that, there is reference to two telegrams. They are on our file E3-952 and E3-871. Now, Mr. Hedder, with telegrams as a body of information. Mr. President, uh, Mr. Co-Prosecutor, could you please uh, repeat the ERN or the identification of the document again to be properly recorded? Yes, forgive me, Mr. President. I I'm going to and give a little bit more detail. E3-952, Telegram 94, that was from POC to Pol, the 2nd of April 1976, and E3-871, which is Telegram 21 of the 21st of March 1976. The book is E190.3, sorry, I'll start again, E190.1.398. It's on the subject of telegrams. Now, can you help us as to when you first got to see, if we call it broadly, CPK telegrams that relate to the DK period? Um, late 1990s at DC CAM. Thank you. On the same book, E190.1.398, it relates to footnote 70. According to the party statutes, Zone party committees were to lead and implement policy down to the district level and below. And your sources are E3-214, the statutes. You refer to Article 19, your translation. As Paul explained it, all problems were up to the party in each locality, but leading cadre of higher echelons must also involve themselves in local work, with zone cadre helping district cadre to direct it. You then refer to our document E3-135, which is a report in the revolutionary flags of Ju June 1976 and E3-8, which was a collection of documents authored 
uh, Ben Keen and, and Chandler Pol Pot plans for the future. I have two questions here. This is about policy going down to the district level and below. From the interviews and direct contact you had with interviewees, did you gather any information that this in fact had happened? Mr. President, uh, Mr. Hedder, could you please hold on and Council Cope, you may now proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the prosecutor is getting craftier and craftier in formulating the questions in such a way that it is a question uh, in strict terms to a witness. Um, but um, lift the veil of the question, and it is obviously a question to the opinion. Uh, of this uh, witness. Um, we can all pretend today, uh, as, we have did, as we have done yesterday, that these are questions to a witness, but uh, we can all see that this question is nothing uh, less than a question soliciting the opinion um, of an expert. Uh, well crafted uh, as it is, but that's in fact what we are doing today, Mr. President. That's, that's why I object. Well, I, I thank Mr. Coppe for his compliment on my crafting. It's not opinion to say to somebody from the interview you had with a person face to face that you were directly involved in, did you obtain factual information about this subject? I'm not asking for his opinion. I'm not asking him to speculate. I'm asking him, as I have, I think, on probably half a dozen occasions already, without objection, to say from the interviews you had, not what people told you, not speculating, not giving an opinion, can you help the court? This is an expert evidence. It's not opinion, and I ask to be able to proceed. Mr. President, if I may briefly, briefly reply. If we were to treat Mr. Hedder as a real witness, we would ask, what has this person told you? Full stop. Now we're, what we're doing is sort of asking him to summarize the things that have been told by him or that he has read in documents and then um, uh, invite him to give an answer. That is exactly uh, what we are doing when we're asking an expert. So I mean, we can all pretend, like I said, that we are not doing it, but we're doing it. Mr. President, my question was, from the interviews and direct contact you had with interviewees, did you gather any information that this had happened? I wasn't asking about documents, and I did that for a deliberate reason. Interviews, direct interviews not comment on documents. My questions about documents have been to authenticate or to explain the footnotes, not to give opinion about documents. My question was about interviews. The President, the 
objection by counsel for Mr. Nunti regarding the line of questioning by the co-prosecutor is not appropriate and not sustained. Uh, the witness, uh, Mr. Hedda, you may now respond to the question if you still recollect uh, the question being asked. You confirmed an extract according to the party statutes zone party committees were to lead and implement policy down to the district level and below. From the interviews you had and direct contact you had with interviewees, did you gather any information that this had happened? From the, the interviews, and indeed summarizing in a sense, um, I think the most precise answer to that question is that yes, the interviews generally described the formal policy as being what is laid out here um, from the documentation, but at the same time the interviews often indicated that formal policy and formal structures didn't operate as they were supposed to operate <coughs> on paper. So yes and no. Thank you. Still within the same document, which is E190.1.398. Moving on to footnotes 71 and 72. It was up to the zone leadership to grasp the line of the party centre and ensure that districts and other localities followed it which meant zone secretaries had the power to give instructions to all sectors and districts. And in respect of that, you refer to our document E3 stroke 8, which was a Pol Pot document, preliminary explanation before reading the plan by the party center, 21st August 1976, and telegram 15, with respect to beloved brother uh, Pol Pot. Um, can you confirm that those were the sources to support that statement in the book? Yes. Footnotes 73 and 74. Same document, E190.1.398. In exercise of this authority, zone secretaries and other leading zone cadre convened frequent meetings of cadre down to the district level, regularly sent written communications to district and other local levels. Now, in respect of that, footnote 73 states, at such meetings, zone cadre reviewed district's past work and did forward planning, passing on the line from the center, explaining party policies, and urging their implementation, giving their own instructions and sorting out specific problems. And here again, you refer to the Kai Polk interview. Is that the same interview that you've already discussed? Yes. And there's another document. I'll read it in. It's not, it's not on our case file. It's 1.6. Commander of the Standing Committee of Zone 203 sends to sector, district, 
sub-district level party leaders, 26th of November 1975, and also 1.64. Sector 23 sends to district, districts and sector military headquarters, and the date of that document is the 22nd of October 1975. In brackets, after each of those documents, there are the letters B, D, N. Now, excuse me if you've already referred to B, D, N, but what is B, D, N in terms of these sources? Um, it's a, to my understanding, it's a cataloging number from the Vietnamese archives. And how did you have access to this information to be able to rely on it in the book? Um, that's explained in, an, in another footnote, uh, which I don't, which is I saw a second ago. It's in it's in it's in the text that's in the folder. Um, but basically, the story is that I was given a set of Vietnamese language documents and Vietnamese language indexes to documents by Christopher Gosha, who's a scholar who works on Vietnamese, Cambodian, and mainland Southeast Asian historical relations. Um, and these were copies of documents that he and a fellow scholar um, had gotten, uh, obtained while on research in Vietnam. So there were two kinds, of, two kinds of documents. There were full Vietnamese translations of what were said to be Khmer Rouge documents in Vietnamese possession. And then there was also an index to other, in Vietnamese, of other documents that were said to be in Vietnamese possession. Um, and then those materials were translated for me, uh, including the index by Richard Arant, who used to work here at the court. I think there may be reference to Mitch Richard Arant later, but we'll see. Thank you. Same document, footnote 78. This is E190.1.398. Uh, sectors also sent documentary guidance to districts. Um, each of the footnote again refers to a number of documents. I'll just shorthand them 1.55, 1 1.6, 1 1.64, 1 1.50, 1 and again BDN, and you've now just described that collection. Can you confirm that it's the same collection we've just covered. Yes, it's the same set of Vietnamese language documents. I'd like to move now to a separate topic. It's going to help you to have file two available, and the topic is enemies. The President, court officer, you may approach the witness if he needs uh, help. Okay, so it's fine now. So, co prosecutor, you may now proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. File two, tab one, document number E31714. Can you please go to page 66?
English RN 0017 Khmer 0032 through 77 and French 00649019 through 20. It's at the bottom of page 66 for you, Mr. Header, and there's reference to number 33. March the 16th, so 1980, Mai Rut, location, source, ex-soldier from Ong Snul area. If we move on to the next page, I've already given the ERNs this statement from this person. In 1972, there were lots of Lon Nol soldiers captured, about 500 of them. All were executed, none were forgiven. Can you confirm that that's an accurate recording of what you were told in this interview? Yes. When we say soldier, the, the reference just says ex-soldier from Ong Snul area, but I wonder is, uh, he was, um, we, we know, uh, if I can take you to page 67, ERN's already given, there's a reference to, as a former Lon Nol soldier, he was kept careful track of, and towards the bottom of the page, as a formal non, former non lol soldier, I was under watch by Norkobal. It would keep track of my movements and listen to what I said. Is that correct? Yes, and the distinction here is that in Khmer Rouge parlance, the word soldier was normally used to refer to Khmer Republic military personnel. They referred to their own military personnel as combatants. Um, the same collection, so we're still in E3 slash 1714, page 43. Do you have interview number 23, page 43? Interview number 23, March the 10th, 1980. Location, Sakkao. Source, Um Samang, from Tambon 21, Eastern Region. And he says in the second paragraph, sorry, I should give the ERNs, English ERN 0017734, Khmer 0032474223, 3, and French 0064899839 for the first two pages. But in the second paragraph, Um Samang, during the war period, I was in the military, in the regional troops, right from 1970. Can I take you to your page 46, English RN 0017 French 0064. 9000 through 01. Khmer 00324746. The people were perplexed and afraid. 
they could not understand how all the cadres throughout the country could be traitors. It was not only the big cadres who were arrested, but whole strings of cadres, all the way down to the lowest level. The people knew that something was terribly wrong, but they were afraid to do anything for fear of being arrested themselves. The method of arrest is always to call someone in for study sessions. If people refuse to come, they were told that it is their duty to attend the sessions. People were not arrested in their bases of power, but at the center where the person to be arrested is the regional committee secretary or military secretary. He is called to a place to study and arrested. The same method was used against Lon Nol officers in 1975. They were asked to go to meet the organization voluntarily and offered forgiveness, but then just taken away and executed. There was special security unit attached to the central committee which was responsible for all this. At the central level, regular forces in Phnom Penh simply turned people over to the security unit. But in fact, the specialized security unit existed on all levels, from the central committee down through the regions, the tambons, and districts. Each was responsible for security and thus for execution at its own level. Can you confirm that that is what you were told in this interview? Yes. Same body. Uh, of information, so E3-1714. Mr. Header, you need to turn to page 25. Do you have interview number 15? 7th of March 1980, Sakao, English ERN 00170716, Khmer 00324712, French 00648981 through 82, the source, former courier for Che Suan also known as non suan Can you can play, uh, please explain to the court again, just very briefly, who non suan was? Um, a veteran communist from the late 40s or early 50s who after April 1975 was the chairman of the Agriculture Committee at the center level, uh, the equivalent of the Minister of Agriculture. Thank you. Your page 28, English ERN 00170719, Khmer 00324717. French. 00648984. In Tambon 25, we were told to prepare for evacuees from Phnom Penh only on the 18th of April 1975. We were instructed to prepare food, water, and lodging for the evacuees to slaughter animals, to feed them and give them co-op rice. 
Each district was assigned a quota of a number of, of evacuees they should accept. We were told that their presence would be temporary. We were told that if the evacuees caused the burden in the co-ops, they should go to the CUM or district committees to ask for surplus to solve the problem. Among those evacuees, the former Lon Nol soldiers, especially the officers, were considered were to be considered enemies. Is that an accurate record of what you were told in this interview? Yes, and in conjunction with what's in the remainder of the paragraph. Same folder, tab six, document number E3 slash 390. I don't want to give the name for the moment because I, uh, it's being checked, but this interview, E3-390. Can you just confirm that on the front page, interviewer Steve Hedder? Uh, I'm just checking to see whether there might be a mistake in the attribution of the name of the interviewee. So if you give me a couple of minutes. The President. Thank you, Mr. Hedda and uh, Mr. Co-Prosecutor. Since it is now appropriate moment for the adjournment, the Chamber will adjourn for 20 minutes. The next session will be resumed by 10 to 11. Court officer is now directed to assist uh, Mr. Hedda during the adjournment and have him return to the courtroom when the next session resumes. And uh, please have uh, asked him to also uh, examine the documents, and we believe that he may take the, the best advantage of this uh, adjournment to review the documents. Thank you. Some